We have two panels this morning uh, and then a closing dialogue. Uh, I hope everyone has a, a program to follow along. Um, I, I won't uh, speak extensively about the school and the, and the conference today, just to rehearse that this is a fairly new department at Arizona State University, School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. We take seriously the ambition to <clears throat> reconnect civic education and liberal arts education in the university, but because we are a department of civic thought and leadership, we have a very extensive public outreach mission, including um, this annual speaker series and annual conference, which we call the, as a whole the Civic Discourse Project. And then each year within the Civic Discourse Project, we pick a theme. Uh, for 2019-2020, the theme has been Citizenship and Civic Leadership in America. We began in September with Robert Putnam of, of Harvard. We had um, single speakers and dialogue sessions in the fall about the, the media and the civic role of journalism, about immigration and citizenship in America, about Arizona politics and the possibility of civic friendship across party lines, Arizona. Our annual Martin Luther King Day lecture in January was incorporated into the theme this year of citizenship and, and uh, civic leadership. Uh, and here we are at this terrific two-day conference. We had two keynote addresses yesterday, Rich Lowry making the case for the idea of America as a nation, more than an idea, or a nation animated by important ideas. And Yasha Monk at the end of the day, talking about the crisis facing liberal democracies, uh, erosion of commitment to liberal democratic principles or values and what, what we could do about it. So um, I do want to mention uh, one, I mentioned yesterday that we have a, a advisory, two different advisory boards for the school and they are listed in your program. We have an academic advisory board, <clears throat> excuse me, which helped to found the school and, and select um, the first director of the school and guide the curriculum. Uh, and Catherine Zuckert may be here or may not be here today, but she's a member of the, of the uh, academic advisory board who's also now teaching as a visiting professor every spring on our faculty. We developed a second advisory board of experienced leaders in civic and political life since we are teaching about civic thought and about leadership. And so one member of that board is with us this morning, Ron Christie, who uh, served uh, on various roles on Capitol Hill as a staff member and then as a domestic policy advisor in the George W. Bush uh, White House and is now an adjunct professor at Georgetown and, and the, the NYU program in DC. So Ron is with us, thank you. That board is co-chaired by uh, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, former Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, and John Kyle, Senator Kyle from Arizona, and, and John was with us yesterday. So we're delighted to have you here. Uh, I will now uh, introduce a friend of the school who is on the ASU faculty in the School of Politics and Global Studies, uh, and he will be moderating our first panel on American citizenship in a global context. So Henry Thompson is an assistant professor at ASU in the School of Politics and Global Studies. His research focuses on the political economy of authoritarianism and democratization. He's the author of the recent book, Food and Power, Regime Type, Agricultural Policy, and Political Stability from Cambridge University Press. He's currently working on a comparative project exploring the secret police agencies of socialist Central and East Europe during the Cold War. And he's an affiliate of one of the two research centers that we have within the school. One is the Center, of Politi center for Political Thought and Leadership, and the, and the other is the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty, which is a joint project with the Business School at ASU. So Henry's an affiliate of the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty. Uh, we're grateful that he's with us moderating the panel. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the kind introduction and welcome everyone to this panel on American citizenship in a global context, rootedness and globalism. Uh, I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel and uh, to announce our three speakers. Our first speaker is Christopher Caldwell. Christopher Caldwell is a contributing editor at the Claremont Review of Books and a contributing opinion writer uh, for the New York Times. He's the author most recently of The Age of Entitlement, uh, America Since the 60s, as well as Reflections on the Revolution in Europe, Immigration, Islam in the West. Uh, Christopher's talk will be followed by uh, Shika Dalmia, 
Shika is a columnist at The Week and writes regularly for Reason Magazine. Her work also appears in The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and numerous other publications such as The Times of London, Time, USA Today, and The Daily Beast. She previously served as a columnist for Forbes and The Washington Examiner. Uh, her feature on sanctuary churches won the first prize in immigration reporting at the 2019 Southern uh, California Journalism Awards. And finally, our final speaker will be Anne Ward, who is a professor of political science at Baylor University. Her research interests are ancient political philosophy, especially Herodotus, Plato, and Aristotle, uh, and 19th century political thought. Her most recent book is The Socratic Individual, Philosophy, Faith, and Freedom in a Democratic Age, which is forthcoming from Lexington uh, Press. And she also is the author of Contemplating Friendship and Aristotle's uh, Ethics, which was published in 2016. So please join me in welcoming uh, all of our speakers and uh, Christopher Corbell to the podium. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to <clears throat> thank you for that introduction. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Skettle for, for including me in this wonderful event. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Paul Carice and, and Carol McNamara. Um, and since we've probably all of us been invited here uh, uh, for reasons related to our expertise, I'd like to begin uh, this morning by maybe describing the stupidest thing I ever did. Um, about five years ago, um, I was asked to give a, a keynote uh, speech at a, at, a, at a conference like this in Bratislava. And I went to um, the airport to fly for, to, to the conference the next day. Um, and I had a valid passport. Um, but it was within, I believe, six months of expiring. And therefore, I was not allowed to fly into the European Union with it. And uh, as it began to dawn on me that I, was, I, I could potentially miss this, um, uh, miss this uh, 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 conference, um, the, the guy behind the Austrian Airlines uh, uh, counter said to me, well, um, you got another passport? And I thought that was the strangest sort of thing. He didn't say to me like, well, this is a long shot, but if you're one of the people with dual citizenship, um, maybe you could show me the passport. No, he expected me to have another passport. I was a, sort of like a Washingtonian, a, a, a well-traveled man. I said, well, why don't you have, yeah. and, and that struck me as the strangest thing. I mean, who has two passports? And I thought about it, and it turns out a lot of people have two passports. And so I'm going to talk about that today. I'll talk about, um, you know, uh, at the risk of, of, of insulting the cosmopolitan academics in the audience, and including a couple of the ones I just thanked, uh, I'd like to talk about some of the problems, potential problems with, uh, with dual citizenship. So <clears throat> dual citizenship was a rare um, status in the 20th century, you know, a couple of children of international marriages had it. There were also some changes of regime, which are not real dual citizenship, but basically as former British Empire subjects were transitioning into being more purely national um, citizens, they had those two identities, um, you know. Um, but today, 60% um, of countries have some kind of dual citizenship, and it's pretty much, it's spread mostly evenly around the world. Um, the, uh, the Asian countries, East Asian countries, are least liberal in that matter. China doesn't have it. India doesn't have it. Uh, Japan has it only for children. I'd say the English-speaking world, um, perhaps because of the British uh, imperial legacy, is the most easygoing uh, part. Who has it is not, doesn't always have to do with ideology. Um, the two uh, archetypally conservative uh, countries of, 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 um, of Central Europe, Hungary and Poland. Uh, uh, Poland has it, but it administers it very sparingly. Hungary has it and, and flings dual citizenships all over the place in the interest of solidarity with, its, uh, with, with, with ethnic Hungarians in other parts of, of Europe. Um, and there are more and more ways throughout the world to become a dual citizen. Um, feminism has been a, a major driver of the, of the increase in, in dual citizenship. With rare exceptions, uh, uh, in the old days, the father's citizenship used to be the citizenship of, 
of, of the family. And in Switzerland in, in, until 1952, um, a woman automatically lost her citizenship upon marrying a foreigner. And things worked more or less similarly in, in Japan until the mid-1980s. <clears throat> there are certain countries, notoriously in the Caribbean, that sell so-called golden visas where you can live there as long as you want, as, as long as you deposit a certain amount of money. And, and, and Cyprus even sells its citizenship, um, uh, which has the added benefit of allowing visa-free travel around the, the European Union. And it, at last report, these citizens, citizenships cost about 1.5 million euros, and Cyprus had made about 4 billion euros off of them. Now, um, the United States, it's been um, a slightly more gradual process. Um, foreigners traditionally take an oath of allegiance when they are nat naturalized as American citizens. And it reads, I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or a citizen. And it actually gets more serious from there. You have to renounce titles and that sort of thing. But today, you can pass US customs and you can show the officer two passports. You can say, I'm coming from the Philippines. Here's my Filipino one. Here's my American one. And all he'll say to you is, welcome home. All right? So this is a new understanding. The old understanding was that dual citizenship was a dangerous thing because it presented occasions for dual loyalty and um, eroded the co social compact on which citizens' rights uh, uh, depended. Uh, the new understanding is that we live in an interconnected global economy in which we are supposed to have multiple loyalties and even multiple identities. Rights are human rights and no national authority needs to guarantee them. Um, but I think that the, the old understanding was actually more right than wrong. Um, I suppose that, that there will always be the need for limited, need, limited uses of, of dual citizenship, and especially for the, the children of international marriages. But the transformation from citizens' rights to universal rights does corrode sovereignty. And there are problems with mass dual citizenship um, that we really didn't consider very much in the recent decades when we began offering it freely. And I think that more serious than the problem of dual loyalty is the problem that it erodes equal citizenship, producing a regime of constitutional haves and have-nots. And for that reason, it sows resentment because it's a it's, a, it's an institution that, like too many in our society, systematically favors new arrivals over the long established. And when push comes to shove, um, the dual citizen has, in certain very important contexts and, and at certain very important moments, the dual citizen has the right to choose the citizenship regime under which he lives. Uh, he can avoid military uh, uh, conscription, he can duck taxes, and he can flee prosecution. And those differences almost never matter. But when they do matter, they matter in a life or death way. Now, let's deal with this question of loyalty first. I've said I think it's, it's, the, it's maybe not as important as the question of equality, but it is the, you know, the classic um, problem. You know, You'd have to be a very provincial person not to see that, that, that there are problems uh, with loyalty to, to two countries. A classic expression of this worry came in the, in the, in the dissent in the Wong Kim Ark case of 1898, which Roger Smith spoke about yesterday. That's the case that, that determined that the 14th Amendment granted citizenship for, for all people born on American soil. I don't want to relitigate -lit that, but, um, uh, but I'd like to quote um, Ful uh, Melville Fuller's dissent. Um, he said, I understand the subjects of the emperor of China to be bound to him by every conception of duty and by every principle of their religion of which filial piety is the first and greatest commandment. 
And formerly, perhaps still, their penal laws imposed the serious, most serious penalties on those who renounced their country and allegiance. The 14th Amendment was not designed to accord citizenship to persons so situated and to cut off the legislative power from dealing with the subject. The problem in that dissent, and I think that's a classic statement of the problem of dual, dual loyalty, the problem is not that newcomers on American soil are bearing American children. That's what we want them to do. The problem is that they are bearing people with a greater and perhaps ineradicable, ineradicable loyalty to something else besides America. And this has the potential to make them half Americans at best. Now, strenuous efforts have been made by judiciaries around the world to protect today's cosmopolitan understanding of citizenship from having to square off against this older commonsensical one. But pr probably the most cosmopolitan citizenship regime uh, right now is, is that of, of Switzerland. Um, yeah, we can talk about the situation there. When the Swiss began gathering citizenship statistics in the 1920s, dual citizenship was almost non-existent, but it has been growing, and that growth has accelerated in the last decade. Dual citizenship has grown by 40% in Switzerland since, since 2010. There are a lot of reasons for that. A third of Swiss marriages are to foreigners, and this creates binational offspring and parental claims of foreign citizenship. But there are also Swiss who live abroad, and um, more than two-thirds of those um, have taken the nationality of another country. And then on top of that, you have a quarter of the Swiss population that is foreign-born. And if you add those together, the so-called mono-Schweizer, as they call them in, in Switzerland, or the, the, the Swiss people with only one passport, account for only about half the population of the country. And in Switzerland, as here, there is a kind of folk expectation that dual citizenship is an exception. And where it's not, I think it, it, it upsets people. In 2018, there was the so-called double eagle affair. And that, that, that came when there were two Kosovo-born and Kosovo citizen uh, players on the Swiss national soccer team taunted their Serbian opponents during a, a, a game by making Kosovar nationalist hand gestures known as the double eagles. And I won't show you how they're done here, but you can probably learn it on the internet. Um, now, I, and so I think it's sort of like, that's a good symbol of why I think the Swiss public has taken a, a populist turn in recent in recent years. I mean, they have, they voted to ban minarets. It's one of the countries in which the uh, populist party, the Swiss People's Party, is, is best entrenched. Um, but dual citizenship does, um, it persists. Now, dual citizenship serves Swiss elites, but you would expect that these would not be government elites. I mean, you'd expect that if you're going to serve in the government of a, of a, of a country, you'd, you'd need to actually keep a pretty clear focus on what your loyalty is. But in, in 2016, the Swiss Bundesrat lifted that uh, requirement. And um, you know, in countries around the world, elites have been kind of straining against this requirement of a single citizenship. And the classic example we've had in the last couple of years is in, in Australia. In Australia, Serving in parliament with a second uh, passport is straightforwardly, unambiguously, a violation of the, of the Constitution. But for a strange reason, there were dozens of, of, of people in parliament who thought, until recently, that they could, um, could do that anyway. And so Australia had a, a, a parliamentary eligibility crisis, as it was called, in 2017 and 2018, where uh, uh, more than a dozen people, 15, 15 parliamentarians had to resign because of their dual citizenships. Um, but I think there was a feeling at the time that, well, this is like uh, one of the ways in which we're an old-fashioned country and things. I think that a lot of people in the elites, a lot of people who are in the governing classes, not just of Australia, but of, of other countries, assume that we're in the middle of a transition to a more multinational 
kind of citizenship. And there are other cases. Boris Johnson, when he became foreign minister in England, had to renounce his American citizenship. There was a case in Canada when the conservative candidate for prime minister uh, last year got into trouble over his dual citizenship, although I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that he kind of toughed it out and he has kept it. So the specter of, of dual loyalty is not just a bugaboo for, for bigots. I, I, I mean, I think it is a real practical problem. And, and, and you can see this in the feudal attempts thus far of Britain, of British diplomats, to secure the, the release of um, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe from Iran. She's a, a dual British-Iranian citizen who's been jailed since 2016 on, on charges of conspiring against the, the government. And, and almost monthly, her husband demands a meeting with the, with the prime minister and, and, um, and calls for extraordinary diplomatic measures to secure her release. But the problem is that she's not a citizen just of Britain, but of Iran. You know, the British passport has on it all this stirring language about Her Majesty requests and requires, but it's very, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to make demands like that when you have a person who is also has reciprocal obligations to the state by which she is incarcerated. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about inequality. Um, um, we're going to have to do, do it fairly quickly, but, but I, you know, I think, so dual loyalty is of, of decreasing importance. Uh, um, it may no longer be the main problem with, with uh, 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 dual citizenship in this world. So let's talk about inequality. Um, let's talk about our own regime of dual citizenship. It comes from a kind of unusual Supreme Court case in 1967 called Afroyim. And, um, it concerns a guy who had expatriated himself to Israel, uh, become an Israeli citizen, and there was a, a question of whether his having voted in an Israeli election um, made him ineligible for his U.S. citizenship, and it was, it was ruled that it, that, that, that it did not. Um, and it seemed like a narrow ruling, but it has been construed in such a way as to mean that there's really almost nothing in American citizen can do abroad except serve in a, you know, like a hostile military that would really cause the deprivation of his American citizenship. And I was, I was struck by something regarding Afroyim that the great legal theorist Peter Spiro of, of Temple University wrote in a celebrated essay about the, about the case. He wrote, you know, it is precisely because citizenship has become less salient that it is now more easily retained. And the fact that it is so easily retained inexorably reduces further its value. And that, he said, is why we, we now tolerate multiple citizenships. Now, this puzzles me. Now, Spiro, who is, is someone, in addition to being someone I've known since I was a teenager, um, and for whose powers as a thinker I have the highest regard, is a, he is a leading authority on, on multinational on multiple citizenships and, 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 and an advocate for them. But I'm not quite clear on what he means when he says that citizenship is less salient and has had its value reduced. So I'd like to sort of like figure out how we judge the salience and value of, um, of citizenship, I think has a good deal with, um, it has a good deal with how we define citizenship. So if we describe it in the Aristotelian way that Susan Collins did yesterday as membership in a, in a political community, then maybe there is a sense in which the value of citizenship has gone down um, in the sense that the scope of action for citizens in a democracy has narrowed where, the, where bureaucracies and judges have taken, taken more power. Um, but where protection is concerned, I think that this, the, the, the power of belonging to a community is still very great. I mean, the seeming unimportance of citizenship is only accidental and contingent. Because in, in the case of war or criminal prosecution or confiscatory taxation, this notional attachment to a country um, is everything. Um, now, suppose we describe citizenship 
not in Professor Collins's Aristotelian way, but in Professor Zuckert's Lockean way, as, as, a, as a collection of rights that can also be described as, as, as property. I mean, here I would say that actually uh, the value of citizenship has increased enormously because certain states are much better capitalized than others and welfare states have been built out. So there's a law professor at the University of Go at the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen named Ayelet Shachar um, who came up with a valuation of a, of a Western passport several years ago that was around a million dollars most of it in welfare entitlements. That when you get a Western citizenship, that's what it, um, that's what it, that's what it amounts to. Um, and so I think that, I think that, 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 that it's not really true that, that the value of citizenships are, are, are declining. I'd like to, you know, close with the, I'd like to, to, to close my discussion of, of dual citizenship with, with this. I think there's a, there's a big, problem, because the human rights regime, which provides the logic for multiple citizenship, is not a law of nature like the, the law of gravity that you, you know, that you can just fall into just by, by liberal, liberalizing. It's a, it's, a, it's a regime that needs to be constructed. And, and I think the globalization of citizenship has certain things in common um, with the globalization of the economy. It's a program of regulation that often tries to pass itself off as a, mm -hmm. as a program of deregulation. And the problem is that the regulation has to be done by somebody. Um, since the dual citizenship regime lacks the basis of custom that the old national citizenship regime had, it's probably going to be built on a much narrower basis. It will tend to be the law of the creme de la creme of the legal profession who try to imagine other classes but, but really get zero input from other classes when it comes to constructing a citizenship regime. And that is why um, even, you know, even though the move from contingent local law to abstract universal law sounds like it ought to bring equality, that's why in fact over the last half century inequality has tended to grow pari passu, as, the, as human rights have been built out. Um, so to conclude, I'd say citizenship rights are not just an abstract thing, they're a practical thing. They have to be not just dreamed up and proposed, but also administered and defended. And I think they are more likely to produce a stable and a just society when the people who are asserting them are the same as the people who are defending them. Thank you. Thanks all for coming and thank you to Skettle School for inviting me here and uh, to earn some street cred with Chris here. Let me just say I'm a proud uni passport holder, uh, American citizen, nat naturalized, and I renounced my Indian citizenship when I became an American citizen. So, um, you know, uh, uh, Trump's unabashed uh, America firstism has put nationalism center stage. And since everything is Trump now, as Rich Lowry told us, this has sparked a thousand ruminations on nationalism on both the left and the right. But the question before, I, before this panel, as I see it, is does America need a project of nationalism to make Americans feel more American? More specifically, can a nationalism offer a way to foster social cohesion in an increasingly polarized country and globalized world? Not to give away the punchline, but the short answer is no. In this, I know I'm sharply diverging from the emerging consensus on the center uh, right that Chris here, along with Rich Lowry and many others represent. Uh, but with all due respect to them, a top-down program of nationalist engineering to unite the country will, I fear, backfire badly, pouring gasoline on the fires of polarization. And it will also for force Americans, paradoxically, to turn their backs on the one true source of their rootedness, their fondness for their founding principles of equality, individual rights, and human dignity. 
Um, these are universal principles that unify them, not just with each other, but also the rest of humanity. Their country is an instantiation of universal principle, which makes it possible for Americans to be both citizens of the country and citizens of the world without any inner conflict. But before I go into why a program of nationalism is undesirable and unworkable, let me push back on the premise of this panel and perhaps also this conference and say why it is also unnecessary. It is unnecessary because if you look past the screechy Antifa activists, Americans are pretty naturally in inclined to not just love their country, but actually also like their country. I came to the United States uh, from India some 30 years ago, and I was immediately struck by the same thing that struck a more illustrious foreigner, Alexis de Tocqueville, about 200 years before me. You know, this conference has to have an obligatory Tocqueville reference, so here's mine. Um, that America is a naturally patriotic country, and I remember being intrigued by the open and self-conscious affection of Americans for their country. To effete European eyes, this might seem corny, but to the eyes of this immigrant from a shithole country, used to government-sponsored jingoistic public shows of patriotism, it was really refreshing and charming to see the display of American flag outside private homes, the heartfelt rendition, and the warm reception of the American anthem before every sporting event, hobby clubs where adults reenact re Revolutionary War and Civil War dressed in period costumes. On the 4th of July, every neighborhood association, every city, every municipality arranges its own festivities. No national law is required, no federal funding is demanded. Laredo, Texas, a border town with 90% Hispanic population, has a century-long tradition of holding month-long festivities to celebrate George Washington's birthday that culminate in a debutante ball where young men and women dress up as figures from the revolutionary period. It's an amazing thing if you ever get a chance to experience this. What is strikingly absent at least uh, until the salute to America that President uh, Trump arranged at the National Mall last year is state pomp and circumstance. Military parades with soldiers in crisp uniforms smartly saluting political authorities. As Tocqueville observed, American patriotism is de very different from the old fashioned old world kind that Chris alluded to, that regards the nation as a father that creates its citizens. America, con by contrast, he said, love their country because as free and productive citizens, they see themselves as its creators. The nation is their offspring, not their father. I'm paraphrasing here. Now, this is not the case in India, my native country, where the Republic Day celebrations involve a massive parade by various military divisions. Four years ago, after a military skirmish with Pakistan, the Indian Supreme Court issued a ruling mandating that every movie theater begin with the rendition of the national anthem and required every viewer to stand up. The time has come the citizens of the country realize they live in a nation and are duty bound to show respect to the national anthem. The constitution does not allow any different notion or the perception of individual rights was the statement. This ruling has since been reversed but such a sentence is unimaginable from the pen of even the most ardently patriotic American jurist. Indeed, far from not allowing any different notion or posture toward the national anthem, this country has insisted on letting its beloved symbols be used as vehicles for protests. Precisely because the understanding in America is that the country exists for the sake of individuals and not the individuals for the sake of the country, Activities like flag burning to oppose unnecessary wars, bending the knee during the national anthem to protest police brutality are protected speech under the First Amendment. This allows civic activism by oppressed groups to alert the country when it is falling short of its professed ideals. Of course, the dissenters and protesters can go overboard, but then their cause fails to sway their fellow countrymen. In short, American nationalism is, is, is has built-in mechanisms for course correction, which makes the country more worthy of affection. The other striking thing about American patriotism, and I'm using the term here interchangeably with nationalism, I don't think there is all that much difference. It does not define itself by something else. 
If Pakistan and Islam were to disappear from the face of the earth tomorrow, there would be nothing left to sustain Indian nationalism. It would be devoid of content, hollowed out. But America's ideals anchor it. The demise of communism didn't diminish America's ideals-based nationalism, it vindicated it. Indeed, it resulted in a wave of democratization around the world, at least for a while. Israeli author Yoram Hazoni, whose book The Virtue of Nationalism has launched the nationalist post-Reagan neo-right in America, makes the remarkable claim that America's classical liberalism is fundamentally imperialistic because its political principles are deduced from Lockean notions about a universal human nature. That leads to a crusading moral universalism that denies the validity of alternative principles of national self-determination, he says. But the fact is that America doesn't have to try and universalize its ideals because the universe vindicates them on its own. In fact, the one thing that most powerfully undermines American patriotism are misguided wars aimed at spreading democracy at gunpoint, as in Iraq, uh, and I will speak on uh, Hazoni a little bit later, but none of this is to suggest that America, pre-Trump, had completely risen above this us versus them impulse. But Trump's campaign to depict Mexicans as rapists and criminals and Mexico as a fundamental threat to American sovereignty is the first attempt in living memory, at least, to mount a whole campaign around it. It is terribly unfortunate and in, that instead of rejecting this idea of nationalism, conservatives are straining to put a respectable intellectual foundation beneath it. It is as if they are buying the notion of the conservative German jurist and uh, philosopher Carl Schmitt that the very core of political life requires opposition to the other because polities, even liberal ones, can't maintain their cohesion on the strength of their own principles. They need a cultural enemy against which to define themselves. And what is the new enemy? Alleged mass immigration, especially from non-Western countries. This has become de rigueur in conservative nationalist circles. Germany's Angela Merkel is out because of her friendliness to Middle Eastern refugees, and Hungary's uh, strongman Viktor Orban is in because he's taking draconian steps to wall off his country to even transient refugees in the name of national security and cultural purity. Now, to be sure, I am pro-immigration because I think immigrants strengthen, not weaken the economic and cultural health of their adopted country. However, I get why others feel that immigration for flows have to be carefully managed. But making opposition to immigration, the central pillar of a program of cultural renewal, treating immigrants as the enemies against whom we have to assert our national sovereignty is something quite different. Now, once you look past this lofty references to Hamilton and Lincoln in uh, Lowry's book, the antipathy to immigration makes him even flirt with a mild version of what I would call a blood and soil nativism. He argues that an exclusively idealistic account of America is a mistake and the criteria for citizenship in the United States is not an attachment to a set of ideas, but birth within our borders. He calls George W. Bush's statement that our identity as a nation, unlike other nations, is not determined by geography or ethnicity or soil or blood willful ignorance because he says it denies the contribution of geography or land to our identity. Geography is our national destiny, Lowry says. He says that celebrating the beauty and bounty of our land in the most exalted uh, terms, and this is his quote, beauty and bounty of our land in the most exalted terms, ought to inform our understanding who can be a true American and who can't. What also matters is if our ancestors shed blood for the country and are buried here. What is Lowry's project here? He's trying to articulate, as I see it, a non-racial, non-religious criteria to anchor a nationalism that is broadly inclusive of those already in America, but not so inclusive that it has to go on the defensive when it has to very firmly reject to the American club those who find their way to the US and acquiesce to its ideals. He wants a form of nationalism that it makes it more difficult for newcomers to become accepted as full Americans so as to not dilute the identity of Americans already here, as uh, Chris was uh, arguing. So if America's principles are not enough to anchor a robust nationalism and race and religion are off limits because that would run afoul of the Constitution, then geography and ancestry are the only candidates available for Lowry's project. 
Lowry does not fully spell out how he is going to implement his version of geographical and ancestral nationalism, but taking in few immigrants and handing citizenship to even fewer and making them wait uh, much longer than the five years after green cards would be one way to go about it. For those like me who see America's idealized conception of citizenship as its great strength, there is nothing to be gained by doing something like this because recent arrivals often have a deeper and more visceral appreciation of America's founding principles because they know what it feels like to live in an unfree and tyrannical country. When some recent Muslim refugees were asked if they were worried that Trump's anti-Muslim statements would expose them to bigotry in America, they said, hell no, we love a country where you can sue the president of it. But Lowry's deification of ancestry and land, blood and soil, will not just make it harder for such immigrants to be embraced as true Americans, but more crucially, it will also make Americans whose ancestor, ancestors don't go back generation feel less American. Who will these Americans be? Hindus, Muslims, Jews, and other religious minorities that don't have a long history in this country? So a blood and soil criteria will also become a de facto religious criteria, regardless of whether that's Lowry's intention. In addition, will we also start viewing Americans who haven't undertaken a national pilgrimage from the Grand Canyon to the Shenandoah as less American? How about the Amish who eschew travel but love America precisely because it leaves them alone to pursue their own quaint ways? Will they be granted space in, cult in Lowry's cultural nationalism as full Americans? What about the Hasids? Would all these groups be turned into second class citizens or worse, foreigners in their own land because they don't subscribe to Lowry's version of uh, blood and soil nationalism? What a project like Lowry's will do is deny individuals and communities their own way of defining their own relationship with America, finding their own reasons to love America. What's more, if this project is serious, it will require state aggression to make it stick. This means that any attempt to tack, tack this blood and soil nationalism to liberal democratic principles will actually just destroy these principles and the true source of American coherence. This is actually precisely what's happening in my native land, India, which under Prime Minister Modi is giving us a real life dem demonstration of what it takes to convert a liberal democracy into a robust nationalistic one. Hindu extremists have been touting a religiously infused blood and soil nationalism or Hindutva before such a thing became cool in the West. Hindutva believes that the only true citizens of India are those whose holy sites sit on the hallowed Indian soil and gave birth to their religion. That includes Hinduism and its offshoots, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, but not India's 140 million Muslim inhabitants equal to half the population of the United States or the 30 million Christians equal to the entire population of Canada because their holy lands lie in the Middle East. Hindutva makes no bones that its ultimate goal is to purge India of these foreign religions and return to the halcyon days when, the only, when only true Hindus roamed the motherland spanning the Himalayas to the north and the Indian Ocean to the south. And to that end, Modi's home minister announced plans for creating a nationwide registry of citizens to separate legal from illegal residents in the country. Only those among India's 1.3 billion residents who produce papers showing they have ancestors dating back to some cutoff year will be included on this list. The overlap with some of Lowry's sentiments is not, not obscure here. Of course, the government knows that this will be an impossible task, 1.3 million people after all, and hundreds of millions of Indians, especially the poor ones, don't, don't know their birth dates, let, let alone have birth certificates of their grandfathers. So the Modi government has passed a law that non-Muslims who can't produce documents will be granted am amnesty and expedited citizenship, but Muslims who can't do so will be out of luck even if they do have ancestors going back generation. So what does India's experience with Modi's nationalistic project prove? It provides a clear example of how empowering a government to impose nationalism does not nurture mutual loyalty among citizens, as Hazoni, the intellectual godfather of the conservative nationalism, uh, which actually I think uh, has inspired certain Lowry-style uh, national conservatism, suggests. 
Why will it not foster mutual loyalty? Because the state prescribed nationalism ends up judging citizens not by their loyalty to each other, but their loyalty to the state's aims and its methods. So in Modi's India, it's not just Muslims and Christians who are considered less Indian. Hindus who don't dutifully line up behind Hindutva's idea of national identity are considered un Indian and anti-national as well. Predictably, as Modi pushes his Hindu nationalistic agenda, Indians are becoming more divided, the exact opposite of what nationalism is supposed to accomplish. Nor can anyone who embraces Hazoni's nationalistic project credibly condemn what's happening in India. Why? Because as far as Hazoni is concerned, judging nations that are striving to build thick national communities by liberal principles of pluralism is an illicit breach of their right to self-determination. The liberal conception of rights and religious liberty is only one among many legitimate political principles, he believes. And he wants nation states to be left alone, not just by pesky international organizations threatening sanctions or imperial powers peddling a new world order at gunpoint, but even diplomatic judgments. Nations should be free to determine their own political de destiny as they see fit without any interference. In other words, Hazoni, in the name of localism and a local identity, is advocating not non-interventionism, but a radical moral relativism in international affairs, where the only standard of right and wrong is what a nation says it is. Not, not any independent theory of natural rights and law. No Lockean conception here. He actually overtly says that. Hence, we were greeted this week to this obscene spectacle of Trump visiting India and praising Modi as a great defender of religious liberty, even as Hindu militants at that very moment were slaughtering Muslims merely miles away. I came to India in the heyday of the cultural, multicultural movement when the conservative right was up in arms over the revulsion, over the relativism of the postmodern left that regarded any effort to judge even Muslim societies that practice genital mutilation as Western chauvinism. So it's been somewhat breathtaking to now watch the same right talk itself into its own version of moral relativism that would give the worst atrocities a pass in the name of national self-determination. To add insult to injury for classical liberals like me, Hazoni enlists in his project the great classical liberal hero, John Stuart Mill. Hazoni refers to Mill's thoughts on nationalism in considerations on representative government, where Mill suggests that too much diversity makes representative government difficult because then one faction can make alliance with the government to increase its power over others. So even liberty and limited government requires nationalism, says Hazoni. Lord Acton, of course, vehemently disagreed. He believed that the more diverse a nation, the better, because that prevents the tyranny of the majority. But setting that aside, Hazoni is even mischaracterizing Mill. Mill certainly believed that common sympathies among a people makes the task of governing easier. But he also said there can be various reasons behind this fellow feeling, religion, language, geography, common history, or identity of political antecedents, as is the case in America. Indeed, Mill cites the example of Switzerland, which he says has a strong sentiment of nationality, even though its cantons are of different races, different languages, and different religions. Furthermore, he states if a, na if a free nation lacks a natural sense of na nationality, one cannot expect it to create one by interesting, uh, entrusting authorities. One of the great advantages of a unified populace is that it is able to limit the power of government, Mill says. But it is putting the cart before the horse to expect the government, once entrusted with great powers to create national unity, that it will actually follow through and risk having its own powers limited by actually delivering on national unity, more likely it will divide and conquer. Indeed, any program of top-down nationalism will backfire badly because it will inevitably try and replace Americans' organic love for political antecedents with an entirely new and inorganic principle of American nationalism. It will empower the government to slice and dice people into an in-group and out-group based on some artificial principle, becoming both more oppressive and di divisive simultaneously. Nation building at home in the name of fostering a strong national identity wo won't work any better and may in fact worse, w work worse than nation building abroad 
in the name of creating a new world order. Right. I'd like to thank Henry for uh, his uh, introduction. I'd also like to thank uh, Skettle, uh, um, Paul and Carol for inviting me to speak at this wonderful conference. And I'd like to thank you for coming this morning. So what I'm going to talk about this morning is uh, Alexander Hamilton on the judicial power and national citizenship. Uh, in Federalist 78, Alexander Hamilton approvingly cites Montesquieu's argument, uh, quote, that there is no liberty if the power of judging be not separated from the legislative and executive powers. End quote. However, unlike Montesquieu, Hamilton famously counsels against fear of judicial power, having, quote, neither force nor will but merely judgment, end quote, the judiciary is the weakest and least dangerous branch of government. From such weakness, Hamilton argues, the judiciary must be strengthened in ways that Montesquieu either argued against or left unarticulated. The judicial power, Hamilton argues, must be put in a permanent body of judges, such as the Supreme Court who hold their offices during good behavior, thereby giving them the requisite independence from the political preferences of the legislative and executive branches. Such independence is needed, Hamilton argues, because the primary function of the court will be to exercise the power of judicial review, uh, in which the court uh, avoids laws that judge is contrary to the Constitution. I argue, however, that there is much in Federalist 78 to suggest that Hamilton might actually believe the courts are not as weak or without danger as he initially argues. I conclude that for Hamilton, uh, somebody's glasses are up here, Sorry. I conclude that for Hamilton, judicial review, despite having dangers, is tolerable. Judicial review is tolerable because the court, in appealing to the Constitution, appeals to a foundational act of consent, understood by the American people as representing their long-term will to limit not only the will of their representatives in the legislative and executive branches, but as scholars such as John Agresto argue, to limit their own short-term or popular will. The American people accept judicial review, in other words, because they understand themselves as having made and consented to the Constitution, and that this Constitution represents their own long-term will. Thus, for the court to seek to apply laws that the American people had no hand in making, for instance, international law or ju jurisprudence arising out of the European Court of Justice, in its exercise of judicial review would appear to be illegitimate. It would deny the American people self-government and sovereignty over themselves. This points to my second conclusion. Uh, understood as a foundational act of consent, the Constitution not only establishes certain governmental structures, but it also separates those persons who consent to and obey it from those persons who do not. The Constitution separates the American polity from other polities it sees beyond it, thus pointing to a citizenship that is national rather than global. Now before going to a, a more detailed discussion of Federalist 78, I would like to frame my argument with a brief discussion of Arash Abazadeh as a representative of the argument of open borders, although my discussion of Federalist 78 will not directly address immigration, I think it answers to it, as a representative of the uh, argument for open borders, and William Barr as a representative of the argument for uh, closed borders or border security, which Abazadeh calls border coercion. To illustrate how I believe Hamilton's argument for judicial review in Federalist 78 points to a national citizenship. Now, in concluding that the legitimacy of judicial review in the American regime rests on a written constitution that also points to a citizenship that is national rather than global, my argument, although not directly addressing the issue of immigration, has philosophical assumptions, I think, contrary to those of Arash Abazadeh. In Closed Borders, Human Rights, and Democratic Legitimation, Abazadeh argues that open borders and the denial of state sovereignty are necessary to secure human rights. Freedom of movement across borders is a basic human right, and necessary to reduce global poverty and inequality. Abizadi goes further, however, arguing that human rights doctrine can ground its denial of states' right to close its borders to foreigners in the democratic theory of popular sovereignty. Democratic theory argues that the persons subject to the state's coercive power, and not the state itself, are ultimately the sovereign arbiter of political questions. For Abizadeh, since migrants subject to the state's border laws are also subject to the state's coercive power, Quote, political rights of participation cannot be tied exclusively to the bounded status of citizenship without violating the basic principle of democratic legitimation. To be democratically legitimate, regimes of border control must be democratically justified to all those subjected to them, end quote. 
Such democratic justification can only be secured if migrants are given a say in making the border laws to which they will be subject to. And thus, quote, requires that the laws governing borders be determined in a political process in which foreigners can participate, end quote. For Abizade, therefore, popular sovereignty does not require a foundational act of consent to a constitution that distinguishes one polity, one's polity and citizenship from others conceived beyond it, as Hamilton implies, but rather the development of, quote, cosmopolitan or transnational political institutions, end quote, to regulate elections concerning the setting and enforcement of state boundaries in which the distinction between citizen and foreigner is erased. Abizadeh, therefore, points to a citizenship which is uh, not national, but global. In his Barbara K. Olson Memorial Lecture delivered to the Federal Society's 2019 National Lawyers Convention, U.S. Attorney General William Barr interprets the U.S. Constitution in a way that directly questions Abizadeh's assumptions with regard to popular sovereignty. The philosophic underpinnings to Barr's argument come to light in his critique of the Supreme Court's decision in uh, Boumediene versus Bush, I think that's how you pronounce it, sorry, in 2008. In the Boumediene uh, case, the court addresses the rights of foreign combatants confronted by the American military on the battlefield. Much like foreign migrants who are confronted by the state's course of power at a closed border, foreign combatants are confronted by the American state's course of power on the battlefield. Moreover, much like Abizade, who argues that foreign migrants subject to state power at the border have a right to participate in a democratic process that regulates that power, thereby erasing the distinction between citizen and foreigner, so the Supreme Court in Boumediene, uh, and this would be Barr's interpretation of it, so the Supreme Court in Boumediene argues that foreign combatants captured by the American military in the battlefield uh, have, quote, due process rights and thus have the right to habeas corpus to obtain judicial review in U.S. courts of whether the American military has a sufficient evidentiary basis to hold them, end quote. In other words, like Abizade, who argues for the effective elimination of the distinction between citizen and foreigner in relation to state power at national borders, uh, the court extends the constitutional rights of American citizens in domestic criminal justice proceedings to foreign enemies on the battlefield and are in conflict with American citizens. So in this case, the American judiciary is, is making itself the cosmopolitan transnational governmental body regulating rights uh, and erasing the distinction between citizen and foreigner. Now Barr, however, critiques the court's reasoning in Bemidian for ignoring the fundamental distinction, quote, integral to the Constitution, his belief, between the state's domestic use of force against its own citizens in criminal justice proceedings and the state's external use of force against foreign enemies on the battlefield. According to Barr, when the state uses power domestically against the citizen, the Constitution's chief concern is the liberty of the citizen upheld to protecting the rights of the accused, separation of powers and checks and balances in which the judiciary using judicial review is guaranteed a primary role. Liberty is the, is the main concern. However, when the state uses its power against foreign enemies at war with the country, the Constitution's chief concern is, quote, and I'm quoting Barr, preserving the freedom of our political community by destroying the external threat, end quote. Such destruct, uh, destruction requires maximizing the government's ability to achieve victory through measures that would be unacceptable in the domestic realm, and which certainly do not include the judiciary protecting foreign enemies from actions of the US military or other political branches. According to Barr, quote, the Constitution does not confer rights on foreign enemies, end quote. Thus, Barr indicates that the Constitution preserves a citizenship which is national rather than global. The Constitution maintains the distinction between citizens and non-citizens because it arises out of a foundational act of consent in which the American people distinguish themselves from other people, peoples, and seek to preserve their liberty by obeying a fundamental law through judicial review that they understand themselves to have made and consented to, rather than made by distant and unaccountable cosmopolitan or transnational political institutions. Now, back to uh, Hamilton, and I'll try and tie it up briefly at the end because I only have uh, 20 minutes. So, Federalist 78. In Federalist 78, Hamilton argues that the inherent weakness of the courts means the judiciary will have difficulty warding off encroachments from the other stronger branches, wishing to bend the courts to their will. The solution, Hamilton argues, having been adopted by the constitutional monarchy of Great Britain and by the state constitutions in the US, is judges appointed during good behavior. Judges with life tenure, Hamilton implies, are less likely to be intimidated by Congress or the president than judges who would serve at their pleasure. If judges were appointed and served like cabinet secretaries, for instance, they would not be independent of the will of the executive. Judicial independence from the will of either the legislature or the executive is necessary, Hamilton argues, because the primary duty of the courts is to exercise judicial review or, quote, to declare all acts contrary to the manifest tenor of the Constitution void. 
end quote. Moreover, it is safe to put this power to nullify legislative and executive acts in the hands of the courts because the judiciary, Hamilton claims, quote, will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution and the weakest of the three departments of power, end quote. Of the three branches of government, the judicial branch is weakest, is the most unlikely to encroach on the constitutional rights of other branches, and hence least threatening to the liberty of the community. Is the judiciary, however, this is my question, really as weak or lacking in danger in comparison to the other branches? I believe there is much in Federalist 78 to suggest that Hamilton may actually believe that the courts are not as weak without danger as he initially argues. An important aspect, just to summarize, of Hamilton's argument indicating that judiciary is not actually as weak or non-threatening to liberty as he initially claims, occurs in his response to opponents of the court's exercise of judicial review. The power of judicial review, Hamilton argues, necessarily flows from the logic of a limited constitution. Hamilton explains, quote, by a limited constitution, I understand one which contains certain specified exceptions to the legislative authority, such, for instance, is that it shall pass no bills of attainder, no ex post facto laws, and the like. Limitations of this kind uh, shall not suspend habeas corpus. But limitations of this kind can be preserved in practice no other way than through the medium of the courts of justice, whose duty it must be to declare all acts contrary to the manifest tenor of the Constitution void." End quote. The US Constitution, therefore, does not just grant powers to Congress in Article I, Section 8, but also limits what Congress can do. For instance, Congress cannot pass bills of attainder or ex post facto laws. Moreover, the soon to be enacted Bill of Rights, the first ten amendment of which passed in 1792, also places limits on the legislative and executive power. In other words, Congress and the President cannot do whatever they like, and hence an independent body such as judiciary is needed to say that legislative and executive acts which exceed constitutional limits are unconstitutional and therefore do not have or should not have effect. Opponents of judicial review argue that the court's power to declare legislative acts void means judicial supremacy. Quote, this is Hamilton, it is urged that the authority which can declare the acts of another void must necessarily be superior to the one whose acts may be voided, end quote. The judiciary under the proposed constitution, therefore, will not be the weakest branch, but rather the most powerful. Hamilton responds to this objection by arguing that judicial review does not imply judicial supremacy, but rather constitutional supremacy, as it were. According to Hamilton, quote, the Constitution ought to be preferred to the statute, the intention of the people to the intention of their agents. Nor does this conclusion by any means suppose the superiority of the judicial to the legislative power. Now, I use executive. Hamilton is always talking about the legislative, but just for good measure, I'll include legislative and executive. It only supposes the power of the people is superior to both, and that where the will of the legislature declared in its statutes stands in opposition to that of the people declared in the Constitution. The judges ought to be governed by the latter rather than the former. They ought to regulate their decisions by the fundamental laws rather than those which are not fundamental." End quote. In the above passage, Hamilton makes an important distinction between two types of consent to the actions of government. Fundamental consent to the structures of and limits placed on government is given by the people through ratification of the Constitution. The Constitution on this understanding expresses the real long-term will of the people to be governed by a certain limited governmental structure separation of powers, checks and balances, and enumerated limits on the exercise of power, which should be understood as fundamental law. Secondary consent to obey particular acts of the legislature passed by representatives in Congress and signed by the president is given by the people through regularly scheduled elections to fill those offices. The consent Hamilton this consent, Hamilton argues, is derivative and carries less weight than the fundamental consent given to the Constitution. Thus, when the courts of, uh, void acts of the legislature and executive based on the reading of the manifest tenor of the Constitution, for Hamilton, they are substituting the will of the people for the will of the people's representatives, or expressing the people's long-term commitment to constitutional republicanism, the rule of law limited by individual rights, over their preferences for the short-term policy goals of their legislatures and executives. As this last point suggests, Members of the executive and legislative branches, when they act, are not simply doing what they like, but rather doing what the people who elected them like. Certainly the people who elected them like to think this. The will of the president, but especially that of Congress, from Hamilton's point of view, will more likely represent the immediate will of the majority of citizens and the courts. Thus, in arguing that the primary duty of the courts is to void legislative and executive acts which exceed their constitutional limits, Hamilton is in fact arguing that an independent judiciary is needed to check the rule of the majority. 
Understanding judicial review in a similar way, scholars such as John Agresto argue that when the founders such as Hamilton and Marshall assert, quote, is emphatically the province of the court to say what the law is, end quote, they're not just denying the power of constitutional interpretation to the people's representatives in Congress and the presidency, but to the people themselves. The people cannot declare what they think the Constitution means and hence judge the constitutionality of their own will simply through regularly scheduled elections. Rather, the highest function of judicial review, Agresto suggests, is not to bind the people's representatives, but rather the people themselves to the Constitution. In consenting to the Constitution, the people agree to limit their own short-term or popular will in order to live by the Republican principles enshrined in the Constitution. Like Montesquieu, therefore, Hamilton believes that liberty requires majority rule be limited by individual rights, or that a true constitutional Republican protects in the courts against, quote, the injury to private rights of particular classes of citizens by unjust and partial laws, end quote. Hamilton's argument linking judicial review with constitutional rather than judicial supremacy is problematic, however, that's my argument, when we reflect more deeply on the concept of the manifest tenor of the Constitution. Does the Constitution actually have a manifest tenor? As, uh, it does have a tenor, but as opposed to, let's say, an e-manifest one. Or is it actually riddled with ambiguous wording open to many different interpretations? Doesn't this ambiguous wording of the Constitution allow judges, when interpreting it, to substitute their will for the will of the people's representatives assembled in Congress or in the executive? What if the courts simply substitute their pleasure or preferences for the constitutional intentions of the other branches? In his response to this objection, I think Hamilton is quite candid, arguing, quote, it can be of no way to say that the courts, on the pretense of a repugnancy, may substitute their own pleasure to the constitutional intentions of the legislature. This might as well happen in the case of two contradictory statutes, or it might as well happen in every adjudication upon any single statute. The courts must declare the sense of the law. That's what the courts do. They say what the law is. And if they should be disposed to exercise will instead of judgment, the consequence would, be e uh, would equally be the substitution of their pleasure to that legislative body. The observation, if it proved anything, would prove there ought to be no judges distinct from that body." End quote. Coming full circle, Hamilton now admits, contrary to his previous argument asserting its weakness, that the judiciary indeed has will in addition to judgment. And it is indeed possible that the courts will seek to exercise this will or absorb the legislative power to impose their own preferences on individuals and the community. Moreover, whereas redress for the unconstitutional actions of legislatures or executives can be had through elections, the only possible redress for unconstitutional actions of judges is a difficult process of impeachment. And this proves difficult for executives too, as the Democratic Party has just learned. Yet, uh, Congress, uh, how, yet according to Hamilton, all this proves is that to avoid this danger from the courts, there should be no independent judiciary separate from the legislature. In other words, for Hamilton, we must accept this danger to our liberty. Judges acting unconstitutionally and therefore politically in their attempt to make law rather than simply interpret it, to avoid a greater danger in, from his point of view, the absence of a check on the legislature, the executive, but especially the legislature, to keep it within its constitutional bounds. Now to my conclusion, uh, national citizenship. Despite the danger uh, that the court may substitute its will for the constitutional will of the legislative and executive branches, for example, as Barr argues in Bumedjian, Hamilton believes that judicial review is tolerable it is tolerable, I would argue, not simply because the absence of a check on the political branches of government is a greater danger, as Hamilton explicitly says. Uh, it is also tolerable because the legitimacy of judicial review is grounded in a written constitution understood as arising out of a foundational act of consent of the American people. In this foundational act of consent, the American people understand themselves as agreeing not only to live under certain governmental structures, but also to limit or check their own short-term popular will expressed in regular, regular elections to the political branches by their long-term will expressed through the Constitution as interpreted by the court when it exercises judicial review. So they're agreeing to that structure of government. In other words, the American people accept the legitimacy of judicial review in which the court appeals to the Constitution to avoid acts of the elected political branches, precisely because they see the Constitution as reflecting their long-term will established in a foundational act of consent. If the court were to look beyond the Constitution, this is following Hamilton's argument, if the court were to look beyond the Constitution to laws or norms that the American people had no hand in making, the legitimacy of the court's exercise of judicial review would be undermined. Thus, understood as a foundational act of consent, the Constitution not only establishes certain governmental structures, 
but it also distinguishes the American polity from other polities in the international system, thereby pointing to a citizenship which is national rather than global. Now just thus far, of course, to conclude, I've been discussing the concept of foundational act of consent to the Constitution as something that can be done in the present as well as in 1788. Okay, so. This only begs the question, what if future generations and newcomers who did not participate in ratification of the Constitution, how do they participate in this foundational act of consent? Like, how do we participate in it? I would argue that uh, from Hamilton's point of view, future generations and newcomers to the country, immigrants to the country, can express their consent to this foundational act by living under and obeying the Constitution and the laws which have their effect through it. Something, unfortunately, that foreigners or those not living under the regime can do. These latter, therefore, although they have the rights of persons or natural rights, may not have the right of citizens under the Constitution. Thus, if the distinction between citizen and foreigner under the Constitution were erased, as Barr argues the court has attempted to, to do in Boumedian, in the Boumedian case, and Abazadi calls for in the critique of closed borders, it appears that this may also delegitimize not only judicial review, but the Constitution itself in the eyes of the American people. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much to uh, all of our speakers. I now have the pleasure of uh, soliciting questions from the audience. We have about 15 uh, minutes for questions, but as a uh, dual citizen myself, I think that I'm gonna raise the first question for Christopher, if that's okay. Um, I'd like to just raise perhaps a, a query or a point that perhaps dual citizenship doesn't always mean the dual loyalty that you think it does depending on the status quo from which we move towards dual citizenship. So I'm basing these comments on uh, my own experiences as a New Zealander and then also on the experience of Germany where I've lived for many years. Now in New Zealand we have dual citizenship but in fact I would suggest it's a strengthening of loyalties towards New Zealand compared to the almost stateless sense of the British Empire that we had before we had national citizenship. So in New Zealand we established a citizenship rule that allowed for dual citizenship, mostly to allow people like my grandfather and great-grandfather to have citizenship of uh, Great Britain where they were born in Scotland and also New Zealand where they lived most of their lives. But that to me seems like a gradual strengthening of loyalty to New Zealand rather than an erosion of it. So that dual citizenship is actually a sign of increasing loyalty to the national state of New Zealand in that case. And I think it probably applies to Australia as well if we look at the grand sweep of history. And in the case of Germany, uh, the, in, the institution of dual citizenship was actually also uh, implied to support our loyalty to the state of Germany for immigrants who previously, despite having perhaps being born in Germany and lived there, they all lived there their entire lives, never had any right to German citizenship. So in those two cases, I actually think that perhaps the institution of our dual citizenship doesn't imply a dual loyalty or disloyalty to the home state, but perhaps actually a move from less uh, loyalty to more. So I'm just wondering whether you'd like to respond to that before we solicit questions from everyone else. Um. Yeah, before before I, I I address that, I just wanted to to to, to allude to, to to one thing that that Shika said in, in in her speech. I think at at, at a point um, you 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 describe both Rich Lowry and me as believing in a in a top down program of nationalist engineering. I don't I don't know how well that describes Rich, but it I, it really. I, I don't think bears any resemblance to anything. I, I, it's not doesn't strike me as even a characterization of of anything I've done. I'm not a. I, I don't understand what you're you're, you're talking about. Uh, I apologize, but I did uh, see your piece on uh, you know Victor Orban that you wrote. I, what was it for the Claremont Review, uh, which to me at least suggested that uh, you know you had some sympathy for some of what he was engaged in and that seemed a pretty, you know, top-down program of enforcing a certain idea of nationalism based on a certain Hungarian conception of what a Hung Hungarian citizen ought to look like. And, you know, you know much more about Orban than I do. Uh, <clears throat> but the kinds of things that, uh, you know, his sort of walling of Hungary has uh, gone along with is pretty draconian controls on Hungarians themselves. So there, you know, he now controls the press. He controls a lot of the political institutions 
institutions. Photographers from Hungary can't go to the border and take pictures of the barbed wire and you know how people who are uh, lined up around it are doing. So you know, I assume that you know that was something that you were at least not unsympathetic to. And if I, I, I if I mischaracterized, I, I no, apologize. Right. I just, I, you know, I, I that I. I you're, you're certainly right that I, I that in that article I, try, I tried to describe the situation out of which which Orban arose and and um, to explain why he was doing things and I would certainly agree that that aspects of his program are a top-down nationalist thing but I uh, but uh, I don't think that makes me a a, a promoter of top-down nationalism in, in, in on, on my own account okay. Um, I now about about dual citizenship. I have a hard time knowing exactly what kind of dual citizenship you're referring to because it seems like there are a couple of different things. There are a couple of different regimes you're describing. The first is the is the transition out of the British Empire and into New Zealand uh, citizenship, which I think is a very different thing than the than the than the um, than the dual citizenship we're describing. I'm, de I, I, I'm talking about citizenship between two countries that do not have overlapping sovereignties. I think that, 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 that your description of, of, of British New Zealand um, citizen, uh, dual citizenship, while not an exa exactly analogous to our dual citizenship in, in the 14th Amendment, the, 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 the two levels of citizenship that Americans have at both the federal and the state level, um, I do not consider that dual citizenship. That's a sort of a, that's a different thing and it's not what I'm discussing. I also think that the British, so, so what you had in the British Empire was there was very little, there was very little differentiation between the, the metropole between between England and New Zealand or, or Canada or, or or actually any part of the British Empire. Um, this is a, a much discussed thing in European um, immigration literature, but actually the British Empire had certain predominantly European countries like um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, and certain um, less European countries like like India. And in, in, in fact, um, the, the imperial status allowed citizens of all of these countries to return to, to England at will. And Britain promoted that after the Second World War when it was, was seeking labor. But it turned out that the, um, that the offer of open, r r you know, uh, open welcome in, in England was taken up more by, uh, boy, by Indians and after partition uh, Pakistanis than it was by Australians and New Zealanders, although there was significant uh, Australian New Zealand travel and so that regime was changed. I consider the, that, that period in which a person born in, in, in Canada or New Zealand was called a UK citizen as, as transitional, but even if it weren't transitional, it would not be the kind of mixed citizenship between two non-overlapping polities that I'm talking about. And it just, I'll, I'll, I'll end in just a second, but I think that the German situation as well, I don't consider a pure dual citizenship because they, 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 ma they made the transition from youth sanguinous or, 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 or law of blood, you, you, you become the citizenship that, that your parents had to you solely, where if you're born on, on German soil and in, in, uh, you, you become a German citizen, more like we have. But when they made that de decision, they still require a decision from foreigners born in Germany when they reach the age of majority or just after. So in their early 20s, uh, say a Turk born in Germany has got to make a decision about whether he's going to be a Turk or a German as an adult. Thank you. Questions from the audience, particularly from students first, please. So my question is, is that considering the Constitution and its use of the word persons and the fact that we award uh, or that we use um, certain rights or we award certain rights to uh, non-citizens, 
uh, for instance, like the First Amendment and other rights, um, the same rights that we award to, uh, to citizens themselves. And the courts also enforce this in the same way, for instance, like Graham, versus Rich, uh, Graham v. Richardson. Um, I guess my question is, is, is Locke's social contract theory, does it still stand in that case? I think that would be a better question for the political theorist over here to answer. Uh, uh, social contract theory has a lot of problems with it, but yeah, go ahead. Let's keep it to uh, theoretically the case I was talking about or what I think uh, the issue is uh, open borders versus closed borders, the rights of citizens versus the rights of persons. So if we go back to yesterday, uh, Michael Zucker was talking about how is it that we le get coer legitimate coercion in society? Right, and the Lockean understanding. And, so Locke, and Locke uses the state of nature to say, well, we have to, any coercion that exists to be legitimated, we had to consent to. So that's a social contract. We consent to family, we consent to government, and it arises out of our social contract. So that leads people like Abbasade to say, so, so democratic legitimacy, a Lockean liberal understanding says that any, any kind of uh, coercion to be legitimate, you have to consent to. But if you come up to a border and it's closed, that's coercive. And if you haven't consented to that, uh, that's illegitimate. And so his argument is that, well, the closed borders, unless there's a democratic process for migrants, unless, so what does that push to? And he realizes that that pushes to actually moving up to transnational associations that regulate elections that set borders. And I have many colleagues who think this uh, democratic uh, liberal understandings of equality and rights require that. So they don't say border security, they say border coercion. Uh, and so I've had colleagues say, well, that means China will set all national boundaries. I mean, I don't think that's what Abbasade means. Uh, but I guess when I look to Hamilton, what Abbasade doesn't, and he specifically talks about, you can't point to the historical, the territorial, historical territorial borders of nations. So for example, Montesquieu's English regime arises out of history. And so Abizadi would point, well, but that, that doesn't count. History doesn't count. That's not a rationally deliberative process. Just pointing to a national border through history is not a rationally deliberative process. I guess the argument coming out of Hamilton is, and I try to base it in judicial review, is that actually the American regime doesn't, doesn't just arise out of history, historical accident, but this foundational act of consent, which the American people see themselves as separating themselves from other polities. And so it's not, and you, when you actually look at the borders of the United States, it actually is a process of deliberation that goes on. So when new states come in, so it's, very, it's not just irrational history, but the United States as it exists as a nation is actually a, pro, a deliberative process. And we accept, so we accept judicial review, we accept the power of the courts because we think, and even if we might suspect that the courts have substituted their will and not our will or whatever, let's say we think they're making law and not interpreting it. So let's say we suspect that but we, we still say, well, we've consented to this process where there is a process of judicial review because we understand ourselves to have made that law that they're imposing. So the very act of accepting judicial review tends to make a distinction between Americans and others. And it's not that you can't, again, it's not that you can't have uh, newcomers, but uh, how do you show, how, how some way have you shown that you have consented to those principles? Well, there has to be a period of time where you obey them. And it's not that foreigners can't do that, it's just they haven't done that at that time. So I think that mitigates against the idea uh, that in fact constitutionalism as opposed to history does point to separate nation states. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but right in the nature of the constitution, so they don't just see it as representing principles, but this people accepts these principles. And if you go to the declaration, well, one people has to separate themselves from another people because we believe in these principles. So it's, it's unique in that sense, like you can be un-American in a way that you can't be un-French, un-British, and it's based on those principles, but that's the test. How do we know that you agree with those principles? You have to go through a legal process. And, that, and, and uh, you have to be here to be able to do that. Um, I will just 
I push back a little bit on that understanding. Uh, you know, I'm a libertarian. Social contract theory has never really worked for me. One of the problems, you know, that you're alluding to would also apply to children. I mean, they didn't, any generation that came after the Constitution, and you sort of alluded to that in your uh, paper, there's a problem. Uh, none of them have consented. But there is the notion of tacit consent, that if you don't actually leave the country, then you have consented to its rules. So I don't think... Uh, uh, you know, the fact that if immigrants come over here and they accept the rules, there's a tacit consent and the social contract stands. Um, so uh, that said, you know, the other thing one has to think about is when one's thinking about uh, uh, political or the, the natural rights of uh, anybody, these are not rivalous goods. You know, it's not like if Americans get them. Uh, then and foreigners get them, that there is any diminution in anybody's rights. This is not a zero-sum game. They can be expanded endlessly. And so there isn't really, to me, any fundamental tension between you know, having an expansive conception of these rights and who is entitled to them. We are almost out of time, so we just need we have one last very brief question and very brief answer. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, uh, Speaking of nationalism and globalism and this kind of tension, uh, David Goodhart in his book Road to Somewhere, uh, he describes this phenomenon as anywheres and somewheres. Um, and he describes it as something that's rooted in identity, and it's a splitting of identity and culture. Um, and recently, the Pew Research Center said that in 2019, 57% uh, of Republicans said that we risk losing our identity as a nation, whereas uh, a majority of Democrats believe that openness is essential to our identity. So. Uh, I wanted to ask, is this a new political divide of identity, and is that the new format and divide moving forward? Um, I don't know. Um, I have seen Godard's book and I, uh, you know, and his conception of anywheres and somewheres. I have some problems with that formulation, but he's not the only one who has suggested that, uh, you know, Tim Carney just recently book Alienated America, um, you know, people uh, who sort of feel left behind because they are stuck in a certain zip code and uh, that zip code is getting devalued. And so they see themselves as getting alienated from the rest of the country where there's a lot of mobility. Um, you know, one of the things that Goodhart also said is that uh, the anywheres, um, their identity is based on achievement, whereas uh, the somewheres, their identity is based on where they, uh, they live. To me, this is just another way of sort of the haves and the have-nots kind of distinction uh, with some more demographic profile, uh, you know, demographic characteristics thrown into it. I don't know, is the short answer. It's interesting. I don't know if uh, uh, this is going to continue to have political traction as we go forward. Uh, you know, there is, we are living in this very, very strange moment where uh, Brexit, which happened by like, you know, the 0.1% uh, vote in its favor, and Donald Trump gets elected by actually losing the popular vote, and we've got this. You know, uh, uh, you know this plethora of treatises to e explain this phenomenon, and it's just unclear whether this, you know, if this is not something that'll burn out. Hi, my question was actually directed at Chica. So you had mentioned how. Modi's nationalism project is basically redefining nationalism in a way that's alienating Muslims. Um, when I recently traveled to India with Skettle, I thought what I would see when I got there was mass spread opposition and deep moral disagreement with the BJP CAA Act. But what I actually saw was an overwhelming amount of support for it. Um, people there even glorify how um, Modi is India's Trump. So my question for you is really, um, if you think Trump in America, like Prime Minister Modi in India, is inspiring a faux sense of nationalism, and if so, if it really is so far off from its true meaning, why have both politicians garnered an incredible amount of support? Uh, just to rephrase, I think Trump is America's Modi, uh, really. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's an interesting question. I mean. Uh, 
India is a 80% Hindu country, 20% um, uh, you know other religious uh, uh, minorities. And uh, I mean, it to me, it is actually a test case study of what weak liberal democratic institutions, how they empower a tyranny of the majority. Now, you can call the tyranny of the majority democracy, and that's fine, but uh, uh, you know, but the democratic element also ought to allow representation from minorities, and Muslims and Christians are getting disenfranchised. I mean, this is the first time in the Indian parliament where you have barely any Muslims represented. That said, uh, the you know, I don't know when you went to India, and I was like you, kind of disenchanted at any, you know, the lack of any resistance to what Modi was doing, that seems to have changed fundamentally in the last few months. Ever since he pushed his citizenship law, it's become kind of clear, uh, you know, not just to Christians and Muslims and other minorities that this is, you know, going to uh, make them foreigners in their own country, but the, uh, the liberal elements, you know, the progressive elements in India that had been sort of morally desolated have become recharged, and they have been massive protests. And uh, you know, part of the sort of the um, uh, the riots that you saw on the street when uh, Trump got there earlier this week was resistance to what Modi is doing. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists and if all the participants. Please join me in thanking the panelists again.